Okay, we're still in uh, Perek Ches. Darche Halimud. I guess we'll start from Chav. I think we may have done Chav, but uh, we can start there. Again, Chav is, again, as mo- most of the Evan Shlema, it's a quotation, or at least a paraphrase, of the Gain's commentary on Mishle. And he says, Kol chacham ayla nishmasei b'chal layla l'misifta shalmayla l'hasig sham ma'ashi i'ef shalahasig b'kes. Again, I think we did go over this, but just this is a reminder, like, you know, we raised the question, like, what's the purpose of sleep? Like, why do the Abishra create sleep? Yeah, once I have a body that has a need, so I have to sleep. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu could have created us without that need. What do they say? They say about the Chedush Harim. The Chedush Harim, the first Ger Rebbe, only slept like two hours uh, a day. So he was asked, how do you get by with only two hours of sleep? He says, well, listen, some people are geniuses. He, ha- he, ha- he happened to be a genius, but he says, some people are geniuses in learning. So they can accomplish in one hour what it takes other people 10 hours. He says, I'm a genius in sleeping. I can accomplish in one hour what it takes people five or six hours to do. Lemaise, he was an Ely in everything, but, but he just, uh, the joke was, he just said he's an Ely in sleeping. But the question is, you know, sleep, uh, you need to sleep. And indeed, uh, you should not uh, cut down your sleep. The Chavitz Chaim used to go into the base medrash and shut off the lights after Chatzais. Because he said, you're mechayiv to sleep. But the question is, uh, why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu create that need? So al pi Kabbalah, one of the reasons is that when the neshama separates from the guf, it can actually understand taira. It goes up to shamayim. So your animal soul is still there. I mean, that's why you're, you're breathing, you're alive. But the godly soul, so it's, it's funny, because if you wake up during the night, apparently it comes back right away. So it's an interesting thing. It's in shamayim, but I wake up, but, you know, punct, it goes back immediately. So it's... It's kind of on a string. But the idea is that when you are asleep, you don't have your godly soul. But what happens is your godly soul goes up to the Masifta Durakiya, the heavenly yeshiva. And it's masig in Yonim of Taira that you wouldn't be able to understand in the Hagbalos, in the limitations of the guf. So sleep is a wonderful thing uh, because it allows you to be masig, those in Yonim, that you otherwise wouldn't be masig. Um, and that's the tachlis of the Bria of Shena. That's what the Gra says. Because there's a machlegis in the Gemara. The Gra, the Gra is really saying shtikol chiddush here. One man, the Amr, says the night was only created for sleep. And the other man, the Amr, says the night was created to, sleep, uh, to learn. So the Gra says it's not a stira because the sleep, gufa, is in order to learn. So the question becomes, though, so you'd ask an obvious question. If I could accomplish in sleep those things I can't accomplish when I'm awake, then why don't I sleep morning Seder? I mean, so I won't come, you know, somebody, why didn't you show up to Seder? He said, I was, you know, I, I thought I would be masig more, uh, more in my sleep. So apparently there's going to be a correlation, and, and that is your ability to be masig, Bishina, is connected to how hard you were amel when you were awake, meaning without the amelus, when you're awake, in the guf, you're not going to be masig those in yon and bishina. Otherwise, that would be crazy. Otherwise, we should just sleep all day, and uh, you'll learn taira. But this is a getter of a reward, meaning a person's miyageya in taira as much as he can, as much as he could. So memela, the only problem is that his guf is maineya him from understanding things in their full depth. So the Yebishter will create a mechanism where the neshama is freed from the guf and it will be able to understand things, but only if you're miyageya, when you're awake, to go as far as you can go. So if I were to sleep without the yagiya b'tayra, I'm not going to get anything from it. I mean, I'll get physical sleep, but I'm not going to get this spiritual elevation of, of shenis. So that's the l'chare the pshat. I mean, the gra himself, as, as it's known, um, yeah, we're not sure if this was his entire life. It, it's hard to know because, um, see, you have to understand, when people describe a Godel did such and such, it may have been for a tekufa of his life, right? In other words, it's not necessarily his whole life. But it's Yadua that the Gra, at least for a large part of his life, only slept two hours. 
And it wasn't two, even two hours. It was four 30-minute periods. He had took uh, f four naps a day. Each nap was 30 minutes. So in a 24-hour period, he slept two hours, but never more than 30 minutes. Uh, well, once again, uh, he, was, he was also a genius in sleep, <laughs> a genius in everything else. He was able to chaperone whatever he needed to chaperone in a short period of time. You know the Misa. The Misa was that uh, the Grah very ra rarely left Vilna. He didn't, I mean, he, he wanted to go to Eretz Yisrael, things like that, but one time he went to a chasna somewhere, a family chasna out, out of Vilna, and he stayed overnight. He stayed in a hotel or in somebody's house, and um, just to show you, they had the equivalent of paparazzi, uh, even then, uh, from paparazzi, in the sense that people wanted to see the Gra when he was either learning or sleeping or something, because he, he wouldn't notice them. So there was a guy that had a ladder. The Gra was staying in a second story. There was a guy that had a ladder, and he was renting out the ladder. You could climb up and you could look into the window, look into the Gra's bedroom, for like uh, three minutes at a time, so you could see the grass sleeping or learning or, or whatever it is you would see, and presumably the grub wouldn't wouldn't even notice you. And, and my man, he was charging. He was charging people get to see the grub for three minutes, you know. So one person got up there and he saw he actually saw the grub sleeping and then the grub waking up, and the grub was very very agitated because he had slept 32 minutes instead of 30 minutes. And he was crying, and he says, oy, 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 I was mafsid, two minutes of Torah, two minutes of Bitzel Torah, how will I ever wake it up, make it up? And then he said, oy, I shouldn't have left Vilna, I came to this place, it's a sleepy town. He says, it's a town that just gairim, gairim sleep. And the grab was mamish mitzayar, over two minutes of Bitzel Torah. And it's brought down there. The whole town was biatzvus when they heard that they were mafsid the Gra, two minutes of Bittal Torah, they were tzabrachim. They really felt that they took something away from the Gra and from the world, the universe. So the Gra was not, the Gra, when the Gra left, uh, he was not back in that town for 30 years. 30 years later, he came back. There was another chasna. <laughs> Someone else got married. And uh, Epis, he only slept for 28 minutes. Mm. And he said, Baruch Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave me back the Aveda. So it's like a Yer Shushan, Sahalava Samecha. The whole city was all, all happy that Baruch Hashem, we were Zaycha to, I guess not everybody was alive then, then from the first time, but the people that were alive said, Baruch Hashem, we were Zaycha to be Machser the Aveda uh, to the Gra of the two minutes. I mean, it's hard to believe a person makes a Cheshpin of bittel Torah in terms of minutes per year. This is the gross of bittel Torah, minutes. Per, and by the way, what, what was the bittel Torah? He slept an extra two minutes. I mean, bittel Torah was not, uh, we, 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 we wouldn't even call it bittel Torah. You know, it may have been answering Shilas, you know, whatever it would be. But uh, the Gra made a cheshman of bittel Torah mamish in minutes. Just, it's just very, very hard, uh, hard to, to understand that uh, at all. But okay. But this is the Tachlis of Shina that the neshama is ayla, and it's masig in yonim, that uh, inside of the guf it would not be able to understand. Meaning when it's imprisoned in a guf, it's more limited. Therefore, there are certain in yonim it will not understand. Okay. Yeah, I remember, Chafal, if we actually looked at it, so I'll just mention it outside again. Remember, that was the correlation that uh, in Torah there is a pshat and there is a sod, and every pshat has to fit into the sod. And therefore, the, the Gra Shita is, there is never a conflict between uh, Kabbalah and, let's say, hal Halacha and Gemara, because everything in Gemara has to be Mechub and al -pisait. And therefore, if you see a stira between Kabbalah and Halacha, which most poskim do see, you either don't understand the Halacha properly, or more likely, you don't understand the Kabbalah properly. Uh, because in reality, if you understand both of them, they're supposed to fit. Now, that's not really a practical advice for us, because th this is advice to a person who knows the Kabbalah, knows the Halacha. They seem to be inconsistent, so he has to work out how they work together. Uh, but to tell you, to tell me, he says, oh, 
when you have a pshat in Gemara, you got to be sure it's mechov and al pisod. What, what, what am I? What am I supposed to be looking for? You know, I I don't know the sod, right? So, I, I wouldn't say this is necessarily practical for us in terms of our day to day, but that's the MS. The MS is that even the simplest pshat has to fit all of the sodos. It's not going to be inconsistent or a or a contradiction. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so now I'm, I remember now. Okay, so now I, th- I think we're up to Chavdalit. Uh, well, right, so we're up to Chavdalit. We, we didn't look at it, yeah. I feel like we just said by sleep. Um, by what? By sleep. Sleep, yeah. Why is one more inclined on Shabbos to sleep more? Well, uh, it could. Re- well, well, number one, I, I mean, uh, as a physical matter, uh, Shabbos, you know, you tend to be more relaxed. So uh, the adrenaline of your schedule, you know, goes away because you have less tension and mainly you get tired. I mean, that's a, that's a very natural thing. That's why Friday night people are uh, always, always tired. But in Ruchnius, it fits what the Gras says very, very well. On Shabbos, you have an extra capacity to understand things. You have a Neshama Yaseira, which already gives you a greater capacity. Mimele, it combines with the sleep in which you escape the guf with the Neshama Yaseira. So you can, under, you can get great hasakos on Shabbos uh, through the concept of Shina. That's why, indeed, Shina b'Shabbos Tainik, sleep on Shabbos is a pleasure, but the pleasure is a ruchniistic pleasure. You could be masik sodos. You know, I remember, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing, you know, um, you know, kids don't sleep on Shabbos. I don't know, I mean, you know, when you're a kid, you don't sleep on Shabbos. I remember when I uh, came to Ner Yisrael, ninth grader, so I was 14 years old, so I, I had never slept on Shabbos. Uh, and like the whole, even the high school, the whole, you know, I, remember, I remember going crazy. It was like Shabbos afternoon, and like nobody was up. <laughs> and I remember wandering the halls. I was like, oh, well, where is everybody? Uh, but after a while, I got used to it, you know, I said, <laughs> sleep on Shabbos. So sleep, you know, serves a beneficial point. Uh, it's also, it's brought down on Shabbos as well that uh, one should be Isaac and Agadita on Shabbos. Because Agadita are spiritual ideas, and your neshama is more open to inyanim of ruchnias on Shabbos. So during the week, our primary Isaac is in halacha. On Shabbos, again, I'm not saying it's, a, it's not a halacha this way, but, but many svarim say on Shabbos, the inyan should be uh, Agadita, medrash, inyanim of, of ruchnias, that, that feed, the, feed the neshama Yisera. Okay. So now, uh, Sif Chavdalet uh, says a very interesting thing. It's a little bit of a chiddish. Kol echod v'echod, kol echod, l'fi ma shemolam din oisai bebeten imai, kein yesh yechilis biyadei lahasik. This is actually a very interesting point, even though it's not the main point that he's making. Everyone knows the... Famous Gemara and Nida, right? Everybody knows that before uh, you're born, a Malach teaches you the Taira. And uh, besides that, you have to make a Shavuah. This is the beginning of Tanya. Tanya in Maseres Nida, Mashbian, I say. That's why it's called Tanya, because it begins with Tanya in Maseres Nida. Mashbian, I say, a person has to make an oath to be a Tzaddik and not be a Rasha. You swore to Hashem that you're going to be a tzaddik. And the malach teaches you the whole Torah. And then when you're born, the malach comes and hits you on the lip, the indentation, and you forget everything, and you got to start from zero. And some svar mad. that's why babies are born crying, because they have an awareness of what was taken away from them. They're crying. They knew the Torah. Now they don't know. So two questions. Number one, what's the purpose of teaching the baby Torah if it's going to be taken away from him? Like, what's the tachlis? Why do it? Answer, because when you're exposed to the Torah, it becomes a chalik of your ruchnius, even when you forget the information. You see, Torah connects your soul to HaKadosh Baruch. So even when you forget it, it makes a reishim. And that's why people sometimes feel, sometimes, they feel a deja vu, right? You ever have that? It's deja vu, meaning you learn something, you're about Shuvah, you hear something for the first time. 
and sometimes it sounds familiar. It sounds like something I knew. It's something that I remember from somewhere. The truth is, it's a residual memory. The neshama is margish something. So you see that the Torah is mashpia on a person, even when they no longer have the information, so to speak. Uh, the Gemara says in the Dorim, Luchais v'shivrei luchais, munachas bi'oren, that in the Oren HaKadosh, were not only the second luchos that Moshe brought down and was given to Klal Yisrael, but even the first luchais that Moshe smashed, the fragments, the fragments were in the Oren HaKadosh, right? The Gemara Baba Basra explains that you had the fragments and the good luchos were on top of the fragments. So if you, if you would open the Oren HaKadosh, you would see uh, you know, the, the second luchos side by side, and under them were the pieces. So the Gemara Darshan is a beautiful drasha. The Gemara says that if a zokein, a Talmud Chacham, has forgotten his learning, dementia, Alzheimer's, has forgotten his learning, you still have to honor him because even the broken luchas are given a place of honor in the Aron HaKadosh. A zokein who forgot his learning is like the broken luchas. But what's the pshat? Why should I honor a and he doesn't, he doesn't know anything now. The answer is no, no, no. Maybe he forgot the information, but all the Torah that he learned is still part of his neshama. His neshama is radiant, his neshama is special. So the baby learns Torah because even though the information is forgotten, the Torah is imprinted on his neshama. So he enters the world in a state of kedusha. Like, like Shivrei Luchas at the other end of life, and it goes the other way. But then you could ask question number two. So why take it away? Let him keep what he has. Let him keep what he has. And the answer is, ultimately, the only Torah that really matters is the Torah that you work for. In other words, Hashem gives you the freebie to be mashvish holiness in your neshama. But the goal is to learn it, to work on it. The goal is not to just to be born having it. Right, this is what they say, but Derech Drush, um, you know, they, they ask Akasha, if you have to stand for a Talmud Chacham, then I should stand for every pregnant woman. A pregnant woman is carrying a baby, at least if it's a boy, at least a Suffolk. I'll talk about a girl in a moment, but Suffolk Zachar, Suffolk Nekeva. If it's a Zachar, the baby knows Kola Taira Kula. A I have to stand up. Why shouldn't I stand up for a pregnant woman? So one answer might be that because it's mechuse in the rechem, it's like it's a different room. I don't, I don't have to stand up for a Talmud Chacham uh, who's in another room in a different rishos. There's a mechitza, right? So that, that's actually, halakhali, I actually, I actually think that is an answer. Uh, but, but the answer that the Bali Musar give is, I'm not going to honor a fetus. The fetus was not miyageya in Torah. I don't honor a Talmud Chacham because he knows a lot. I honor a Talmud Chacham because he's miyageya in Torah. So yeah, the fetus knows, but there was no yagiya. So kavod Torah comes from the yagiya that a person puts in, not from the, uh, the fact that they know stuff. You know, you can have a brilliant guy who knows stuff, but he was not miyageya in the Torah. In fact, it was interesting. I, um, my Rebbe was, I, I mentioned him when I read Rev Yaakov Moshe Kalevsky, uh, art school, it's an art school biography, which uh, someone gave me. So it's really nice. Like I'm quoted a few times myself there. But besides me, I, my quotes are not particularly great. But uh, just it was nice to hear all sorts of maizim that some of which I knew, some of which I didn't know. But uh, this word is said there that a Talmud came back from Eric Israel to tell him this word. And uh, Rev Kalevsky was actually upset. He says, you had to go to Eretz Yisrael and look at that as a Chiddush. He says, it is, he says, it is so pashat that Kavod HaTayra is because of Yigiya. He says, you know, Kleski was a little upset that to the Talmud this was a Chiddush. Because it means he hadn't absorbed the importance of what Yigiya Satayra, Yigiya Satayra is. You know, that's the idea. That's what we're Mechabit. That's what we're Mechabit. Um, okay, so 
this is the idea of the baby learning Torah. So there are two ideas here. One is to imprint his neshama with Kedusha. But we take it away so his Torah should come through Yagiyah. Okay. Now, the point that the Gra adds here that is actually uh, a Chiddush is that most of us assume that every, in fact, I just said it actually, the way I said it, that everybody is the same. Everybody learns Kala Terakula. That, that, that's exactly the way I, I described it. It says, but if you look at the language of the Gra here, you see an interesting thing. Everybody gets a different allotment, meaning it's not that everybody learns everything. Rather, Hashem in his Chachma decides what is your chilek of Torah, what is your chilek of Torah, and that is what you're expected to know in your life. Of course, the problem is none of us knows what that chilek is, but the time is going to be, achar meya v'yesrim shana, we're going to have to give a test on all of the Torah that we were taught before we were born. <laughs> but it's not... So it's a mudna thing because there's no way of knowing. Meaning it's not the idea that every single person is expected to know all of Shas. Every single person is expected to know what the Malach taught him. Now, since I don't know what the Malach taught, taught me, so I have to do everything I can possibly do. But I'll leave it the MS at the end of the day. The accountability is what the Malach taught you, Bebet and Imai. So this is a very interesting Kiddush. In other words, it actually indicates that people are taught different things, Bebet and Imai. Now maybe, just maybe, he doesn't say it, maybe that's connected to Masha Libay Chafetz, right? What, what makes people attracted? to certain inyanim, right? Why some people get a real geschmack from some inyanim, and the same inyanim that some people get a real geschmack, other people, you know, don't enjoy as much. And Chazal do say there's an inyan to focus on mashal libay chafetz. It could be mashal libay chafetz is taka mechubar, that's your chush of maybe what the malach emphasized with you. That'd be your chalik, uh, your chalik of Tyre. No, who knows? But nevertheless, the Gra says here that whatever the Malach taught you, Bibet and Imai, that is what you will be able to understand. And therefore, what that means is, pretty scary a little bit, Umi Shahaya Yachayel Lahasik Saidai Satira. So if you have the capacity to understand the mysteries of Taira, Kabbalah, and you didn't bother, you said, ah, I don't have to learn Kabbalah, I'll just learn Gemara. Mm-hmm. There will be harsh judgments against you for not pursuing a chilek of taira that a Baruch Hu enabled you to do through the teaching of the of the malach. Again, it's it's kind of hard to apply this in practice, but you do have a sense what you're able to get, what you're not able to get. Meaning, the concept is uh, it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you're able to get it, then that means the Malach taught it to you, right? Something that you're not able to get, maybe the Malach didn't teach you, or maybe you have to work harder, you know? That's also gonna be a problem. I mean, he, the Gras certainly does not mean if I don't get something the first time, I simply, oh, forget it, the Malach didn't teach it to me. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we're talking about a person works, and a person works, and a person works. But if at some point uh, he sees it's not going, so maybe he should put his kaychais in a different chaylik, a different chaylik of Torah. But it's very, very hard, to, very, very, very hard to know. I mean, uh, you know, how long should your investment be? Some want to connect it to five years, right? It says Leviim, right? Uh, one pasuk says Leviim began their avoid of carrying the uh, clay amikdash. Play a Mishkan at 30, and another Pusik says 25. So what is the drasha? That at 25 you're an apprentice, you're an assistant, and you get a full position at 30. And from here we see in any endeavor in life, if you train for five years and you're not matzliach, go on to a different job because a levy trained for five years. So which means more than that, if you're not matzliach, this job is not for you. Right? Chazal have a drasha. In Chulin, 
that uh, five years is the maximum. So a lot of guys in yeshiva go to their Rosh Yeshiva and they say, I've been here for five years. He says, uh, and I'm not Matzliach, so I gotta leave yeshiva. So the Rosh Yeshivas usually don't like that. I mean, sometimes they don't, they don't understand, but they don't like it. But they give two terutsim. There are two different mahalchim that they give. <laughs> One you might call tough love terutz, and the other is the warm and fuzzy terutz. The tough love terutz says, Chazal say, if you tried something for five years and you're not Masliach, who says you tried? What you did is not trying. So Mamela, you know, it doesn't count. You've got to have five years of trying. That's the tough answer. The uh, warm and fuzzy answer is, ah, five years and not matzliach. What do you mean not matzliach? What's halach, what, what's hatzlacha? When you came here, could you read Rashi? Can you read Rashi now? Das heist hatzlacha. When you came here, uh, could you read a Mishnah? Can you read a Mishnah now? Hatzlacha, yeah, it's not as much hatzlacha as you would like. It's not as much hatzlacha as you could have had. But to say you're not matzliach, sorry, we don't accept that excuse. You vaday were matzliach. So it depends how you look at it, right? One is, you didn't try. And the other is, yeah, you were matzliach. The common denominator is, you got to stick it out. You know, that's the, that's the tzad ha like both, uh, like both, both terutzim. Uh, but well, my say it is a real problem. I mean, the problem basically is when do you go on to something else? I mean, it's even though gay, I single, so yeah. I'm focusing on a certain kasha. I get obsessed. I can't go on because I have this kasha that's driving me nuts. When do I go on? And you got to go on. What do they tell the mice? Uh, who was it with? I don't remember who it was with. I, I think maybe the Shagasari, but that. Uh, Somebody asked him a kasha, and the, and the person said, I have been on this kasha for months. For months, I can't sleep, I can't eat. This kasha is like eating me up. So the Sagasari said, or the Gadol said, ah, I have a teretz. I am, you know, Taisvis Nazir, daf so-and-so. So the person was so excited, he went to the Shaz, he took up Masechus Nazir. He opened the Taisvis. The Taisus had absolutely nothing to do with his question. Nothing to do with his question. So he didn't understand. Maybe the, the Rebbe had some Iluyasha, you know, ingenious connection with it. So he says to the Rebbe, he says, I don't understand how this answers my question. So the Rebbe said, okay, tell me what Taisus says. Well, Taisus begins with Vatema, and he asks something. He says, okay, and what's Taisus's answer? He says, he doesn't give an answer. Tema is there's no answer. And what comes right after that? He says, well, that's the next Taisus. He went on. So the Rebbe said, that is my teretz to you. My teretz to you is, Taisus also had a kasha. He couldn't answer. And he went weiter. He went weiter. Right? So you have to know, uh, you have to know uh, that you do have to go weiter, but you write down the kasha. Don't, don't lose it. And often what happens is, and I hope maybe you even, even experience this, as you learn more and you learn more ideas uh, in the Masechta, sometimes the questions get answered. You know, it might very well be that, you know, <laughs> your, que your question is what the Gemara will ask, you know, 10 dafim from them. <laughs> sometimes, I mean, I, I've had that experience. I remember as a, a Bachar, I had like really brilliant kashas. Problem is, the Gemara asked it, you know, five plot uh, ahead of time. So I guess, I guess it's something to be proud of. I was machavin to the Gemara, okay. But, you know, obviously, if you would go on, you would see the question addressed, right? So a lot of times, our questions are important. We have to keep note of our questions. It is important. Write it down, remember it. But at some point, you have to say, okay, I have this question. Let's go weiter and see how things develop. What is important, again, forgive me for repeating it, I, I say this a, a lot, but it is very important, is that uh, you be clear about what you don't understand, meaning there are two types of problems a person has. Sometimes there's a very specific problem. I don't understand how this is a raya to this yisod because of so-and-so. That's great. That is a very specific, defined difficulty that's giving you trouble, 
write it down, go write her, and then look at it again in, in six months. But then there's another type of problem where things are just fuzzy, things are just cloudy. That already you should not go write her, meaning try to, try to know what you don't know. In other words, even if you don't know, but at least I know what I don't know, because when I know what I don't know, that also means I know what I know. In other words, it's a good thing to give yourself chizik sometimes. When there are a lot of things in a sugya you don't know, ask yourself this. What in the sugya do I do know? And you know, you might be pleasantly surprised. You know, there may be 10 things you don't know, but there may be 25 things that you don't know, even if they're pushed things. You know, I know, you know, I know uh, a woman needs to get, well, whatever it is, just to say, I, I know these in Yonim, I know. So it's important to kind of ask yourself, what do you know and what don't you know, as opposed to just being confused. So confusion, you try to clarify. But the actual carrots to questions, you can often wait. Often things will get clarified on their, on their own. Like this is one of the arguments for learning faster. Again, again it's a whole big debate, learning fast, learning slow, you know, et cetera. I mean, in some ways, um, the derech of yeshivas, <laughs> there's a joke in statistics that um, if I put my head in a freezer and I put my feet in boiling water, on the average, I'm comfortable. But, you know, so we have Ian that goes extremely slow, and then we have Bakias that goes really fast. Oh, so on the average, I have a good pace. <laughs> but, but the MS is, the Ian is too slow and the Bikiyas is too fast, right? So we're kind of doing both things, not, not so well. On the average, it turns out to be the right pace, you know? So the MS is, the Ian should be faster and the Bikiyas should be slower, which means almost there's no difference between them, meaning it's kind of the same Seder in which my goal is to have Chlor, Pshat, hopefully in, in Rashi and Tysis, and maybe one or two other, other Rishonim. Right? So it's an interesting thing to think about. Um, I mean, Rav Shach wrote, you know, I remember reading you know, Rav Shach's letters come out uh, in a few volumes. So I remember reading a letter. He was writing, the yeshivas are learning too slow. Okay, then I'm reading another letter. The yeshivas are learning too slow. I said, I'm thinking to myself, didn't I, didn't I just read that? And then another letter, the yeshivas are reading. I mean, he, <laughs> he must have written 100 letters in this. Like every letter is saying the same thing, like over, over many, many years. And I kept on saying, did I, you know, did I just read that? Yeah, I did, I did just read that. You know, it's kind of, you know, going on and on. So the funny thing about the yeshiva shederech is that most of the Russian yeshivas were critical of it. I mean, the people that ran the yeshivas didn't, didn't like the derech, the derech alimut, right? So it's a funny thing that um, somehow nobody has the power to, to really, really change it, it's kind of so enmeshed as part of the, part of the system. So, okay, but again, I mean, you know, I don't, I don't want to create difficulties for you. I mean, you know, you have to do what you have to do and, you know, but whatever. Uh, but at least at some point in your lives, you know, what do they say? The whole yeshiva shederech, the, 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 the idea is you learn how to learn. You learn how to learn, okay? So at some point, you learn how to learn and after that, you got to learn. So this is learning how to learn, okay? But that's not learning, per se, meaning, meaning you then move to a different level where you learn. And learn is not going to be the same way as learning how to learn. It's going to be a different, type of, a different type of process. But okay, don't get me started on this. I could uh, talk uh, too many hours. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah. How long does one person spend learning how to learn? Yeah, so it's, it's interesting, you know, you often have a, a good sense of this. In fact, uh, guys come to me a lot and they say, for example, uh, they were in Rav Kanek Shear for, for two years or something, and they feel, they feel that, you know, they absorbed an approach to things and uh, all that's happening is they're getting more of the same. Now, everything is Tyra, but they feel that they're not getting any new place, they're not getting to any new place. So often you have a sense, is it just uh, a sense more of the same methodology or 
is there still notions that you're expanding, you know, in terms of uh, your ability to understand Rishonim and the like. So often you've got to monitor yourself as to um, how are you feeling about it. Do you feel you're still, uh, you're still growing, etc. You're still learning new mahauchim, or new ways of approaching things, you know. So uh, a lot of people say they, they kind of instinctively feel when it's time to move to the next, uh, move to the next step. Okay. Um, alrighty, so now uh, we're up to Chaf Hey. Meyes Chorban Beis Hamikdash. From the time of the Chorban Beis Hamikdash, Nisarev Hakail Toiv Bara. So this is also an interesting, deep idea, a little bit. The Grah says that from the time of the Chorban Beis HaMikdash, in all good, there is a mixture of bad. In all bad, there's a mixture of good. Now, now the MS is, most say, this idea, they don't connect it to the Chorban Beis HaMikdash, they connect it to the Chait of the Eight Sadas. Remember, the chet of the Eitz Hadas was the Eitz Hadas, Yedea, Toiv, Vera. So let me first talk about that idea, then, then we'll go back to this. Rav Chaim Shmulevitz, based, basing on a lot of earlier Svarim, says that the chet of the Eitz Hadas created everything in a contaminated, mixed state. So in all of our goodness, there are negative elements. And even in our Averos, there are certain positive elements. Well, let me explain where he says it on. He says, the Gemara says in Mesech Shabbos that if you judge people, lekaf sechus. My Pirkei Avos says you should judge everybody, lekaf sechus. That's Pirkei Avos. The Gemara in Shabbos says, if you judge people, lekaf sechus, Hashem will judge you lekav sechus. Sounds good, but that actually makes no sense. Judging lekav sechus means normally giving people the benefit of a doubt. So an example would be that if I'm walking uh, here, uh, or I'm walking in a place, and I see somebody go into, let's say, a treif McDonald's. I'm not going to opine on a rabbanit McDonald's, but let's say a, a treif McDonald's and I know they normally keep Shabbos, I am mechuyev to assume that they want to use the bathroom. See, it's interesting. They have a chiyev, al and maybe not to go in there. That's their chiyev. But my chiyev is to assume that they're using the bathroom or they're getting water or soda. I give people the benefit of the doubt. Don le kapsuchus. But Hashem doesn't have a doubt. I mean, what are you saying? Uh, if I judge them when they go into a McDonald's that they're not eating treif, then Hashem will give me the benefit of the doubt when I go into a McDonald's that they're not eating treif. Hashem knows one way or the other. What shayach by the Rebani Shalaylam? He will judge me lekaf sechus if there's no suffolk. So if Chaim Shvalevit says, we see from here that judging lekaf sechus isn't only about giving people the benefit of the doubt. It, that's an aspect of it. You now, Rebbe Samet, Rabbi Samet's uh, wife, wrote a great book called The Other Side of the Story, in which you, know, you judge people, the kaf sechus, etc. So certainly, giving people the benefit of the doubt is a chalik of the kaf sechus. But Rav Chaim Shalevit says it's not the only, only part of it. Judging the kaf sechus means in every action, there is a mixture of good and bad. In the good, there is bad. In the bad, there's the good. Now, what does that mean practically? In the good, there is bad, meaning I might do mitzvahs, but my kavana is not pure. Sometimes I'm doing a mitzvah to be a balgaiva, or sometimes I'm doing a mitzvah like helping somebody, but I resent it and I'm angry. So in my good is nisare veira. And lahepach. In my Ra, may be Nisarev, at least a mitigating factor. 
Maybe I did something bad because I was so exhausted. I was hurt and I behaved inappropriately. Meaning, in my taif there is ra. In my ra there is taif. So says Rav Chaim Shmulevitz, judging lakaf sechus means what part of the other person's action do you want to focus on? Do you focus on the good of his action? Or do you focus on the negative of his action? You have the right to focus on whatever part you want to focus on. But Hashem will look at you the same way. If you look at the Ra of the person, Hashem will look at the Ra of your actions. You see the Chiddush here? In other words, instead of saying, oh, you went into a McDonald's and you're certainly not going to eat the Treif hamburger, this is a deeper thought. Okay, I see him eating the Treif hamburger, but I understand that there must be so, such pressure that he's under, that I have Rachmim. I will focus on the good within him. And that's a tremendous thing, because then Hashem will look at you in a much more compassionate way. This is a deep idea of what it means to judge a person the kapsachos. What, what do you choose to focus on? You know, let me give you a, a, a practical example that parents, uh, you know, uh, would know. Let's say that uh, you went out for the, uh, to, to something, you went out for an occasion, and you know, you let your kids alone, uh, let's say they're nine, 10, old enough, whatever the age that you would leave kids alone. And, in Montgomery County, it's like 25, but okay. Uh, but okay, here we leave them alone at a younger age. Uh, and you know, you come home and uh, they wanted to wash the dishes. And you come home and you see a pile of dishes that are broken on the floor. Plus, you know, you almost broke your neck because uh, the, the floor is filled with uh, slippery, slippery water. So. The typical parent will get upset. And, what are you doing? You made a mess of the kitchen. And but there's another way of looking at it. You know, they wanted to do something nice. They wanted to help you. They wanted to make your life easier. Yeah, they messed up. There's Ra. They did a bad thing, so to speak. But in the Ra, there's a lot of Tov. Meaning, what was their Kavana? What was their motivation? And if we could get beyond the immediate frustration, of, you know, the kitchen is dangerous and the dishes are broken and everything else. And we focus on the taif. That is the deeper meaning of judging the kaf sechus. And that's what the Gemara in Shabbos says. When you judge people the kaf sechus, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will judge you the kaf sechus. It takes an avayda. I'm not, I'm not saying this is easy and it's, it's not necessarily natural. But uh, we kind of focus on the negative right away. We focus on the negative. The Gemara in Shabbos says, based on a Pasuk in Eif, that if there are 999 angels that say a person is unworthy, and one angel out of a thousand says the person is worthy, and it, of that one angel, 999 parts says the person is not worthy. So it's one thousandth of an angel that's one out of a thousand, Hashem says, that's good enough for me. And we're the opposite. Sometimes a person can have 999 positive qualities and one negative quality, and we immediately see the negative. We just see the negative. And it sometimes it doesn't give us rest. It bothers us so much, you know. But that's not the midah of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's not the midah of judging, of judging the kapsachos. You see? So that's, uh, that's Rav Chaim Shemulevitz's point, a beautiful point. And that's why judging the kapsachos is yitochein even by HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So the reason I brought this in, I, it's, it's a good machshava anyway to, to be aware of, is that the theme that in every action there's a mixture of taivara Rav Chaim Shvulevitz says that goes back to the chait of the Eitz Hadas itself. Here I read in the Gra that this is me'eis chorban be'samikdash. 
again, I, I don't know what the Makar is. I'd have to look up uh, the Kune Zohar, other, other, where, where this is taken from. But apparently, one of the things that existed when there was a Beis HaMikdash was a much clearer demarcation between goodness and evil. Meaning goodness was good and evil was bad and you didn't have the taruvos of taiv vara. And the Grosh says, however, one of the kilkulim of the Chorben Beis HaMikdash is everything got submished, everything got mixed together. Ra b'toiv, b'toiv bara. Okay. Now, what conclusion does he draw from this? So he says an interesting thing. L'chein, kol shimushe kabbalah masis hu oven polili. Okay, so this is really something that's, that's totally beyond this. Let, 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 me, let me just go over the terms so you're familiar with this. You know, there are two types of Kabbalah. Uh, there is called Chochmas Kabbalah, and then there is Kabbalah, either Lamaisa, or here it's called Kabbalah Masis, or Kabbalah Shimushis. Chochmas Kabbalah is the study of Kabbalah at all different levels, starting from basic. Remember, Pshat, the four levels, Pshat, Remez, Drish, Said, exist within every level. So in Said, there is Pshat of Said, Remez of Said, Drush of Said, Said of Said. Right? There is Pashat Pshat in Kabbalah too. Okay. But be it as it may, that's learning Kabbalah. Ish Lafi Madre Gatsai. From superficial to the deepest of the deep. Practical Kabbalah is something very different. That's when you're able to actually use Chachmasa Kabbalah to manipulate reality, to do miracles. I mean, we would call it almost magic, but it's white, white magic. Magic, I shouldn't use magic because that connects to Kishav. It's, it's, it's from the Kokos of Kedusha. You can summon Malachim, you can do different things. Uh, you read stories of Makubalim, uh, flying carpets. Right? They went from uh, India to Eretz Israel, whatever it is. This is a certain Madrega of Kedusha in which you're able to be mishtamesh with the sodos of the Bria, creating a golem would be similar to that, creating a golem. You're able to be mishtamesh with the kochos of Kabbalah to manipulate and change physical reality. That goes by the term Kabbalah uh, masit, practical Kabbalah. Practical in the sense that you're actually doing stuff uh, with it. Now, it's interesting. It is very, very interesting that um, there was a huge number of svarim on practical Kabbalah, but almost none of it was ever printed. Uh, the only printed svarim of Kabbalah were the Chachmasa Kabbalah, Kisvayari, things like that. But the Kabbalah of practical was only kept by the Mekubalim in manuscripts. So they tell me, I don't know for sure, they tell me if you go to uh, the yeshivas of the Mekubalim in locked cabinets, you know, they have these old manuscripts that hundreds of years old that go through all of these things. So here what the Gra is saying is the following. The Gra is saying that chas v'shalom b'zman azeh, anyone, so again I, again, I don't think it's so nogeya to us, but he says anyone that wants to be mishtamesh in practical Kabbalah to manipulate reality is an avain palili, it is a very, very serious Avera because Bisman Hazah, because of the mixture of Tovara, when you do things that are kind of magical, there is going to be a Taruvos of the Kochos of impurity in the Kochos of Kedusha. And the difficulty is that we often cannot distinguish it. In fact, this is a problem anyway uh, today when people, even though it's not necessarily going to rise to this type of you know, magical thing. But people go to Mekubalim, and the Mekubal says, uh, the gematria of your name is this, and therefore you shouldn't marry uh, this because you want to do it this way. And uh, they say, what's going to happen to you in two weeks is, uh, you know, uh, don't, whatever it is. They, they tell you, the, they predict the future, they tell you things that are going to happen. So the MS is, uh, this is a matter of great concern. Rebecca Hillel wrote a whole book on this, uh, 
I know the English is called Faith and Folly. Uh, uh, yeah, the Hebrew is Tamim Tia, Tamim Tia, uh, in which a lot of people, a lot of people who claim to be Kabbalists, see, it's interesting, it's not just that they're fakers. If you're just a faker, a faker doesn't do any harm. A guy who pretends to know stuff that he doesn't do, okay, it's not a big deal. But what's really dangerous is that there are people that may have a certain koach. They can actually make things happen. But they're mishtamesh with koiche satuma. See, that's very different. To simply say a guy is a fake, okay, I mean, a fake can be dangerous too because it misleads you. But the fake is not going to play with your mind and affect your neshama. But when you're dealing with people that are linked to the koiches of tumah, that's danger. That is dangerous stuff, mamish, because the kayach is real. The kayach is real, but it's called sitra achra, the other side. When the kayach is real, and it's not rooted in kedusha. Now, why Hashem created these things is a good question, but certainly the world of Kabbalah recognizes that things like kishuf and things like shadim uh, are, are realities. They're not just fake things. So that's what the Grah is warning you against. The Grah is saying that because of the taruvos of good and evil, uh, you should not use Kabbalah in any practical way to change realities because there is going to be a taruvos of kaychay satuma and that's going to be a very, very dangerous thing. And he says, this is daima. This is actually a repetition of the chait of other Marishain, who ate from the eight sadas, that's a mixture of tovara. When you're mishtamesh with Kabbalah masis, you're eating from the eight sadas, you're ma'arev, tovara. So he does bring in the eight sadas on that, on that level. But then he says, there is an exception. Hayyidim l'chavein kavanais v'yichudim al borian. I mean, there are mekubalim who understand how to have the proper kavanas, the yichudim, the unifications of the different parts of the spiritual universe, etc. Uh, which aspect of Hashem should you bring down? Because again, in Kabbalah, uh, the nikud, even the vowelization of the Shem Havaya, has a different combination. There are 12 combinations. Uh, each one has a unique uh, kavana, etc. So if one really knows all of these inyanim, then it's shayach, and that's called the eight sachayim. Remember, there were two trees in Gan Eden, the eight sadas taivara and the eight sachayim. So the idea is the eight sachayim is the tree of life. That's when you know how to use sodos and connect to kedusha. Taivara is when it's nisarev, right? So you have to go to the eight sachayim and not to the eight sadas. Uh, but uh, once again, it's a warning. Again, it's not so much of, well, well, the truth is it is a warning even for us. I mean, most of us are not going to be able to uh, levitate to do other things. But there are, I mean, th these, are, these are kind of the dangers of, um, you know, uh, certain types of meditation, certain types of mysticism, uh, Eastern religions. You know, what is the problem there? Because they, they do have a genuine koach. And at that point, you're, you're connecting your neshama to things that are improper. You know, people often ask um, about going to doctors who are not from. I can, can I go to a doctor who's not religious? So it really kind of depends. Uh, if you're being treated for a physical thing, you know, I have a broken leg, then sure, who cares if the doctor, I mean, maybe there's a schuss of a from doctor, but, you know, the doctor doesn't have to be from, and Rabbi Yashav, when he was being treated for heart condition, had a Catholic, had non-Jewish doctors come in and take care of him. So when it's something that's physical, the goof, so it makes no difference who's treating you. Let it be a guy, let it be a yid, let it be a from Jew, let it be a secular Jew. But when you're talking about, let's say, a therapist, you're talking about psychology, you're talking about spiritual guidance, you're talking about getting into your head, getting into your brain, getting into your feelings, getting into your emotions. At that point, it's, it's a little dangerous to have people who are rochak from the Torah kind of getting into your head. 
because they can influence you in all sorts of ways. Uh, superficially, they could change your value system. Okay, that's one thing. But on a deeper way, especially if they're spiritual, because there are, there are these spiritual gurus in the world. In fact, uh, a lot of B'nai Torah are very attracted to them because uh, they're charismatic and uh, they're very powerful speakers, almost hypnotic speakers. Uh, and I'm, I'm not saying they're totally no good either. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that. But at least there's the taruvos of Tovara. So you've got to be very, very uh, careful about it. Yeah. So the, like mental health books and things like that that are in my going, that's like psychological and the rest of things are all in the same time? Uh, I don't think it's the same danger. In other words, I'm not really referring necessarily. I mean, I mean there, there, there are things you've got to talk about also. There may be ideas there that are not kosher. But the danger that the Gras is talking about is not Stam psychology books. It's more of the, uh, the gurus that try to connect to your soul through energy healings and things like that. That, that. That's what I'm talking about because that's a different process. You know, psychology is simply, you know, somebody's telling you their thoughts about something. So maybe it's good, maybe it's not good. You know, uh, so there's always a problem, but it doesn't have that danger of actually linking to your neshama. But I'm talking about, uh, you know, if you look around, you'll see there are also all sorts of people. A lot of them became millionaires through this. They discovered, because there is a thirst in the world generally. There is a thirst for spirituality. And there's all sorts of guys and women out there that are kind of capitalizing on this. In fact, you often, you often see, by the way, that a lot of these people, again, I'm generalizing, I'm not saying everybody, a lot of these people wind up being extremely abusive. You know, uh, they take teenage girls and, you know, and uh, they make a harem, they marry a uh, hundred girls, whatever it would be, because it's almost a mind control. They kind of own you. And uh, whatever they tell you to do, you think is like a holy thing, when in fact it's a, you know, toeva. Yeah? How can you tell the difference between uh, the good ones and the good ones is not so good. Yes, so, so in, in Yiddishkeit, Rav Hillel, when you're talking about Jewish, like, you know, so Rav Hillel says that the Mekubal, number one, has to keep halacha. If he's not from, then for sure he's not good. But number two, he should also be a big Talmud Chacham in Shas and Paiskin, right? If a person says, I only do Kabbalah, I'm not really interested in Gemara, then by definition, He's not connecting to a holy place. As any genuine makubal must be also be shakua in, in Shas and Paiskin. And you'll actually find that a lot of the so-called makubalim, you know, who advertise, but Dafka don't, don't learn any Gemara at all, you know. They're not connected. They, they may even be, you know, Amaratsam in it. And Rav Hill says that is always a very, very negative, even if they keep, even if they're from, uh, but that's a very, very bad sign. It doesn't mean they're malicious. It, it doesn't, he, we're not saying they're malevolent, but it means they're not connecting to it at a level that would be from Kedusha. It's not their fault, but whatever it is, uh, you need to have that yesod. To reach the level of connection to sod in Kedusha, it has to be built on the nigla of Tyra, he says. Okay, okay maybe we'll stop here. And, uh, we Next week, still, we're still on, right? This man is not over yet. Okay, okay. <laughs>